Welcome to World Methodist Evangelism's Real Faith, Real World podcast, connecting the faith within us with the world around us. At World Methodist Evangelism, we desire for Christ followers within the global Wesleyan family to become agents of transformation by sharing the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is accomplished through training, gathering, and resourcing to fulfill our mission to equip and encourage Christ followers around the world to share their faith in the context of today's realities. My name is Rob Haynes of World Methodist Evangelism, and we want to express our appreciation to Christ Church Global in Memphis, Tennessee for sponsoring today's episode. Would you take a moment to rate and subscribe? Your subscription and rating helps others hear about this podcast and all the great things that we share on these episodes. We'd also love to hear from you about this episode or any other. Email us at podcast at worldmethodist.com. Org. Thank you for listening to this first part of a three-part series on the connections between evangelism and discipleship. Today's conversation is with the Executive Director of World Methodist Evangelism, Kim Reisman. Welcome, Kim. Hey, Rob. Thanks for having me. Great, as always, to talk with you on the Real Faith, Real World podcast. We've been talking about evangelism and discipleship because they are uh, two sides of the same coin, uh, as some people have described, and we can only share our faith with others when we are more aware of our own relationship with Christ. And you've written a material called Embrace that helps us do that. Would you kind of catch us up a little bit on Embrace and just what that is? Well, thanks. Yeah, Embrace is... um it's a study that uh, small groups or individuals can do that uh, that focuses on uh, what I believe are six foundational um, values or core values of evangelism. And um, by focusing on those values, uh, people are encouraged to kind of go deeper into their own faith experience so that then they're they're more in touch with their own story. They become more in touch with the way that their story uh, intersects God's story, and uh, then they're able to to translate that into more natural and authentic conversations around the topic of faith. It's a wonderful material, and I like the way not only just you talk about the topic of faith sharing, but some ways that that is, um, is done and the posture in which it's done, not just a formula, but different principles. And those are humility, clarity, prayer, integrity, worship, and urgency. And over this three-part series, we're going to talk about those six different aspects, uh, those six different principles, and maybe how they relate in some ways that we hadn't maybe considered them previously in terms of face sharing. We're recording this on the Monday after the U.S. presidential election. Joe Biden has been named as the president-elect by media outlets using uh, the data that they often do that with. And those results at this point are being contested um, by President Trump. Christians find themselves in different parts of this conversation in particularly an area that is polarized even before the, um, the, the events of this election. So I wanted us today, Kim, to talk about the two parts of humility and integrity. Because in um, the current cultural context, it is so important that we recognize the Christian values, the, the, the Christian teachings, the the way that Jesus has demonstrated humility and integrity to answer the world's anxiety, difficulties. And we realize that there are people listening all over the world, but we also recognize that people um, are watching from all over the world what happens in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about um, humility and how we use that sort of posture to learn about our own discipleship and then how to engage the culture around us? Well, that's a great uh, question, Rob, because I think humility is uh, a crucial element actually in any in any context, uh, but particularly particularly right now when we're in such a um, uh, a divisive uh, moment. Because at least in the United States, uh, as we're thinking through this post election situation. Um, 
it's it's very evenly divided. I mean, uh, the the president, um, uh, the supporters of President Trump are almost even in number with the with the supporters of 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 indeed. Joe Biden. So there there we are indeed in a divided situation. But this isn't unique to the United States because the 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 world um, has experienced division um, historically forever, basically, and many people live in in situations of division uh, and polarization uh, all over the world, and also in in situations of pluralistic um, environments where there's a lot of com- competing worldviews, and so in order to be able to engage others in these kinds of contexts, um, not just from the perspective of sharing our faith, but from the perspective of being a Christian and understanding the importance of how we carry ourselves, um, as you said, the stance that we take uh, as we engage the world, uh, humility is a foundational element of, of, that, of that posture or of that stance that we take. Um, and, and the basis of that, that humility is a willingness uh, to see the world as it is, uh, not as we want it to be. So um, we may have opinions about how we wish the world to be. We may have opinions about how we wish others to behave or others uh, to believe. Uh, but that's not the relevant element, what we wish it to be like. What's relevant is the reality of what is. And so we have to um, have the humility to accept that, uh, accept the world and see the world as it is. Not that we want to leave it that way, but we need to at least start with an acceptance of the reality in which we are in. Um, And that's one of the only ways I believe we're going to be able to engage the culture. Um, And when we're able to do that, then we're able to reach out uh, in a way that doesn't require... uh, change on the other person's part first. We reach out before anything and everything else. And in fact, I think I think we talked about this on another uh, episode when we talked about reordering right. the order. Um, we, we reach out to others before anything and everything else. Um, we, you know, before, before they, they realize that they need to change, before, um, bef- before everything, we're willing to reach out. And we can't do that unless we have the f- humility uh, to see things uh, as they are. I think it's really important that you mention that it's not just in the United States at this particular time that has been a, a source of conflict, even between Christians. I mean, we can look, mm-hmm. it doesn't take long to look into history to see that uh, wars have been fought over Christian principles. Um, mm-hmm. We have been fighting over this and dividing and and schism uh, has been happening even down to uh, New Testament times when uh, when you see you know thinking about Matthew coming in as a tax collector being into uh, brought into the fold of the disciples and I can just imagine that there was some hey wait a minute you know that guy is working for the other side what's he doing in here and so this is not a, a new idea um, and Jesus answers that very directly about how we are to to move into these situations of conflict, even when maybe we're the person seen as um, as the the object of scorn. That's right. That's that's exactly right. And and, and particularly in um, in situations like that, or 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 like what we're living in now, um, one of the first steps um, in term in my in my view in the. One of the first things we have to do as a people who are committed to humility uh, is to recognize um, that that we might be wrong. I mm. mean, we we don't yeah. have every single bit of of knowledge that we need to have, sure. uh, and we may be wrong. And um, and so at the very be- at the at the outset, we have to be willing to um, uh, have a heart of confession, like a a willingness to confess our own shortcomings uh, rather than take a stance of blaming because that's that is really a uh, a major component it seems of a divisive environment and I know that's definitely true in the United States right now everybody wants to blame everyone else for all the problems that we um, are facing and um, that's it's never everybody else's problem I mean everybody uh, all human beings have fallen short we all, 
uh, need forgiveness. Uh, none of us is perfect. And so a willingness to confess our own shortcomings and recognize how we might be part of the problem ourselves is a first step in, in, um, in being an alternative uh, to the divisiveness that we find uh, around us. Let's unpack that a little bit more. What's the role of the prophetic voice in that then? Because there is somewhere that it has to come down. And what is the role of the person who sees a clear teaching in Scripture or has a, a certain message that God wants to share that may be confrontational to some? What? How do we reconcile those examples in Scripture as well? Well, I think that the, I mean, Jesus even <laughs> Jesus knew uh, what was right and good, and 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 taught what was right and good. I mean, we we are all committed sure. to that. But the way in which he did that never discounted ah, the views of the other right. person. He was always willing to listen. He was always willing to um, treat treat the other with uh, with respect and with value because um, he knew and lived uh, in such a way that. That people re- recognized that they were valuable uh, human beings made in the image of God, and Jesus treated everyone in that way. So even though he was committed to a particular teaching and wanted, uh, you know, wanted to be clear about that, he never did it in a way that devalued the people around him, and that's crucial. You can, it, what that means for us as human beings, it seems to me in this moment is that, yes, we hold our convictions, and we, we hold on to our convictions, but we hold them lightly. Uh, we hold them with uh, in the palm of our open hands, not in our clenched fists. Mm. Because if we're going to hold our convictions with clenched fists, what people are going to see is our fist. They're not going to see our conviction. And it's, so it's only if we hold those convictions uh, with grace and with an openness uh, and, and with a, a, a sense of recognizing the value of others and, and they, the fact that all of us are made in the image of God, all of us are of infinite value to God, uh, only if we have that kind of posture will, will we be able to create an environment of trust and, and caring in which deep things can be shared, whether it's deep things of faith or, or just deep things of life uh, can be shared. I think that's a beautiful image of the, the open hand as opposed to the fist. And what is it that people are seeing? Because too many times uh, with Christians, people have quickly seen our fists, but not necessarily our open hand that says, put your hand in mine. And then bringing that person to Jesus and let Jesus do the work that Jesus does to, uh, to convict of sin, to ask people to repent. And then we as Christians walk alongside that person in a mutual discipleship. Though we may be at different places on the road to discipleship, it's not mm-hmm. our job mm-hmm. to make sure that that person is the correct disciple. We can encourage, we can you know, we can offer some correction, we can offer some teaching, but ultimately it's not us up to us to be the judge and jury as well. Well, and that's right and that that brings me back really uh so frequently to um uh, one of my mentors, Billy Abraham, his his uh, advice to me, and and as I was exploring the whole concept of evangelism, he he said that some things cannot be said until after other things are said. Uh, and so, as we're walking with people, and as we're sharing faith, or even just as we are sharing life with other people, um, not everything needs to be said right at the very very beginning. I mean, there are things that uh, we have to wait to say. Uh, until people are are further along in their journey, um, and there are things that we have to, that others have to wait to he- to say to us that we may not be ready to hear um, uh, at at any given time in our in our journey. So part of being like Jesus is is to be um, perceptive and sensitive to those kinds of issues, and knowing when when is the right time to talk about certain things, and when is it not appropriate or or helpful. Uh, to talk about certain things. So let's take this to a little more practical level. If someone is listening now and saying, you know, I really like what you're saying. I think it's really helpful. 
But here's my situation. I am uh, in my office, uh, one of the only Christians around who thinks like this. Um, there are other people who say they're Christians, but they uh, use very hurtful and hateful words, or they're uh, really coming at it with that closed fish posture. How do I even begin to engage in conversations with people who may be reading the same scriptures that I am, but seeing it very, very differently? And then the big thing is, is that I want to share faith with other people in the office. I want other people to see that we're all getting along, but I don't even know how to enter this space of conflict right now in a way uh, with humility with my own fellow Christians and with people who uh, are not yet Christians. What do I do? How, how do I even begin? That's a really hard question. Uh, it really is. I mean, because these things are easy to talk about uh, on a podcast <laughs> and always a lot harder to, to do when you're in the break room or at the grocery right. store or just around the, you know, in the backyard at a barbecue or sure. whatever. But I think that... Um, the, the the first thing for me is uh, again if if we're talking about humility, um, and and this plays into integrity also. Um, one of the first things is we have to listen a whole lot more than we have to speak. Mm. Uh, I'm, you know, navigating through times of of, of divisiveness or uh, or even even just ordinary pluralistic contexts, uh, we do well to listen. Uh, a whole lot more than to talk. We learn a lot more uh, when we listen uh, than we do when we're talking, and and so um, so part of it is a, a and listening is a is a stance of humility. People re- when you listen to someone and truly truly attend to them, you're showing them by your behavior that you think that they're valuable, regardless of whether you agree or disagree on a on any particular issue. But the fact that you're willing to listen to them and actually hear them um, it, it says a lot. And, and listening isn't just a, a quiet, passive thing. Listening is actually really active and takes an enormous amount of, of energy. Listening involves uh, carrying the other person's conversation along, being willing to to ask uh, questions, not not inflammatory questions or not questions that are um, confrontational, but questions, uh, sensitive questions about what it is that, why it is they feel the way they feel, how does, how does this affect them, what is, you know, all of those things that, that again, point to the fact that we believe uh, in, the, uh, in the value of, of the other person. And I think that is a, a, a key thing, and that plays into integrity in the sense that, um, you know, integrity is a, is about recognizing, um, you know, that we're again not the only people with with the answer. Um, that other people have things to offer us as well, and um, and when we're when we're willing to listen and when we're willing to value people, they re- they're going to see in us uh, the fact that we actually believe that they have something worthwhile to offer us, and that we're open enough to. Listen for that, uh, and and mull it over, and take it seriously, and, and think about it. And that right there uh, changes the dynamic completely. When people recognize that that we're we're interested enough to listen, and that we actually think that they might have something to offer us, that that totally changes the dynamic. So let's keep talking about integrity. Uh, what do you mean by integrity as it relates to embrace and discipleship and evangelism? Well, in- integrity is all about wholeness. Uh, it's about a consistency of life uh, and a wholeness. So our our words, uh, if we have integrity, our words are going to ring true with our lifestyle uh, and vice versa. So um, we're not going to be uh, talking one way and walking a different way type of thing. Um, and and that's, that's an important thing because people aren't going to be willing to... Uh, People aren't going to be willing to give us a hearing about anything if they see that we're not even following our own, you know, our own um, commitments, uh, and and that's an important thing. If we're not, um, but that no, we're not perfect. So we're we are going to be inconsistent at times. Sure. I mean, nobody is perfect, 
Um, but the, a willingness to be honest about that mm. inconsistency uh, and a willingness to admit that, well, yeah, I really do believe this. Um, I, I, with all my heart, I believe it, and I'm striving for it. I'm just, I've, I've not achieved it yet. Right. I still think, I still believe in it, and I'm doing my best to, to, to work toward that. But this is where I'm at, and this is my struggle. That honesty um, also uh, points to our integrity because we, we are genuine and authentic, uh, and that is a, a, a key thing. Um, life is unbelievably ambiguous. Uh, morally ambiguous. There's, you don't have to look far in our in our world to see that um, that 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 you there's no true uh, black and white. There's always a gray area, and we have to be willing to accept that ambiguity in an honest way um, that that doesn't hide the the struggle that that. Lets people know that we struggle just as much with these th- with these difficult issues as as they do, uh, and here's where we come down, um, and we recognize that they may come down in another place, but we're willing to talk it through because again we value them. We're willing to listen. We're wanting to grow together, and it's and it's again it's a more open situation rather than an adversarial one. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the ambiguities. Um, Again, there has to be a place to come down somewhere, um, and people frequently try to figure out just where that is. Um, can you help us think again about an example? Uh, if someone has been trying to share faith in the coffee shop with uh, someone that they've gotten to know there, and uh, this other person knows that that you know you're a Christian and, and you're trying to talk with them, but they point to you know the failings of a pastor who did not keep her vows. And so, you know, she's asked to leave the church or it's someone, you know, who is a volunteer at the church who winds up stealing from the church or something like that. Or even in the bigger picture, when Christians fail to uphold the the morals in the public square with their words and their actions by backing a particular person or an idea. And the world looks at that and says, look at you Christians, you can't even get along. You can't even figure it out. And here I am, just someone trying to share my faith in the coffee shop with a friend, and other people are behaving in ways that make it even more difficult. Um, how do we navigate those sorts of areas of, of integrity, and, and what do we do with that? Well, again, I think honesty is the um, is the major component of all of that, uh, and humility, because again. Um, if we're if we have the humility to to be honest about our own struggle, I think that makes a big difference. Uh, and I think that I think the conversation in, in some ways needs to shift a little bit from um, as uh, well in the context of a one on one conversation. I mean, your example was the person in a coffee shop, and you're having a, you're having a, a conversation. Uh, that's different than if we're if we're Giving a speech and a you know and trying to defend the faith in a in a sermon or in a speech right, or something sure. like that, but if we're talking you know in the context of a trusting relationship and a conversation, and you're talking about Christian faith, what we're talking about is faith in in Jesus Christ, faith in the living God as revealed in Jesus mm. Christ. We're not talking about faith in the people who follow Jesus Christ. Wow, that's an important distinction. So our faith is. Yes, that's a huge distinction because our faith is not in the people who call themselves Christians. Our faith is in Jesus Christ, and uh, and that's a big difference because all again, all of us uh, are fallen. We're we're all not not a not a one of us is perfect. And I do believe that as we grow in faith and we mature spiritually, and that is a, an important thing. But there will always be ways in which. Uh, we fall short, and um, and so the the question becomes not uh, are we trying to share faith in the Christians that are around us, but are we willing to share faith in Jesus Christ and admit that as a follower we aren't perfect? Mm. And but the bottom line is we're willing to walk with each other as we try uh, to follow and as we and we, as we 
grow in faith and become more in tune with the Spirit and develop the mind of Christ so that we make progress um, in, in, our, in our life um, of grace and sanctification, all of those things as we grow in our faith. But it's a journey that we're on. And if we're not willing to, if we're not willing to be honest about the fact that it's a journey, then I think that we are going to always have this problem with people saying, "Well, what about the pastor that did this, that, and the other, and 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 you know this person and that person and blah blah blah?" When in reality, that's not what faith is all about, because again, we're, our faith is in Christ, not in the people who follow Christ. It's a really important distinction because oftentimes the world looks at the the people who follow Christ as uh, an excuse to not follow Christ or um, a, as a reason to. And uh, and it's important that we operate in a way that uh, points to Jesus rather than our good works or our accomplishments or anything like that. Absolutely. That notion that you know we may be the only Bible that some people reads, it's kind of a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. It is. Well, and that doesn't let us off the hook, though. I mean, because we really do have, uh, we do have an obligation as as a follower of Jesus to behave in a way that reflects Jesus. Right. So, I mean, it's not that we have a big excuse. Um, however, it is uh, that it's one thing to try to make an excuse, and it's another thing to actually have an honest conversation about with someone. Great point. About a struggle. Those are those are two separate things. And I'm not advocating for making excuses, but I am advocating for being um, having enough humility to admit and be honest about the struggles that we have as we seek to follow faithfully. So humility and integrity are linked uh, in so many ways. And that makes me think of one thing that I've heard you say to me before, is that reciprocity is the thing that underscores both of those. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah. Again, um, it has it has to do with the willingness to 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 see others as valuable, and to see others as having something valuable to offer us. A lot of times, when 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 uh, Christians are relating uh, to to people outside the faith, or or when we're when we're relating to people who disagree with us, we make an uh, assumption that we're the ones that have something to offer. Uh, and and especially when you're talking about evangelism and faith sharing, we're the one the Holy Spirit's working through us in order to change the other person. And that is not, uh, I personally don't believe that's the way the Holy Spirit works anyway. The Holy Spirit is always working between people. The Spirit's working within me, the Spirit's working within you, and the Spirit's working between you and I. So, so it's never one directional. It's never one directional, and um, and humility and, and integrity. When they're when we when we bring those th- two things together, then we're acting out of a, a way that emphasizes reciprocity, and and uh, and recognizing that others have something to offer us, that we can grow in our own faith because of things that we learn from others. Uh, others have insights that they can offer us. Others have shared experiences. There's all kinds of ways in which we can grow simply through our relationships with other people. And there are ways in which the Holy Spirit is using other people uh, in order to build us up, in order to shape us, in order to grow us spiritually. So it's a a two-way street for sure. So there are all sorts of connections between evangelism and discipleship. We are growing when we're sharing our faith. We are sharing our faith when we're growing as well. And that's one of the things I really appreciate what you've done in Embrace is tie those things together so that if we're going to share faith with others, if we're going to expect to do that and have a posture with that, we've had a time to reflect upon our own uh, Christian walk uh, along the way. Ken, we've been working on Embrace in a lot of different ways, um, particularly with everything that's going on these days. Why don't you just kind of run down some of the different ways that people can use Embrace or or get connected with the material of Embrace through world evangelism? Well, uh, um, the the Embrace study book uh, can be ordered on the uh, World Evangelism website, um, worldmethodist.org. And also we're in the process of creating um, uh, additional materials to go along with that, videos and things of that nature, uh, so that uh, small groups or individuals can utilize that material uh, for their own discipleship. 
We also do, um, you know, workshops, obviously, uh, Prior to the the current uh, pandemic situation, we we were we would go into um, churches uh, and do workshops over the, over the course of a couple of days. We still do those things, but now we have more hybrid options with with digital uh, opportunities, u- utilizing Zoom and different um, different uh, digital platforms. So there's a lot of different ways in which uh, people can explore this. Um, either again, just with the traditional method of a of a study book and as a small group, or in, or just on your own, or with uh, with another with groups of people in the context of a of a Zoom workshop webinar type of situation. And we'll put a link to um, the website, of course, in the show notes. And you can always email us at podcast at worldmethodist dot org uh, for more information um, on those. So, Kim, I want to thank you again for the conversation today, and I'm really excited about this three-part series when we can talk about um, evangelism and discipleship and how they're related together, and particularly helping us look at that material of embrace um, in in a different way, not just as a faith sharing, though it is an excellent way uh, to share your faith, but also in matters of discipleship. So today we talked about humility and integrity. And in future episodes, we're going to look at the relationship between clarity and prayer and also worship and urgency. So I encourage you all to catch those future episodes. You know, Kim, we're going to add a new part of the podcast, a new feature uh, that we're going to ask uh, of our guests. And you get to be the one that helps me inaugurate this um, and uh, these three episodes as we're talking about evangelism and embrace and uh, it's something that you've been reading, something that you have been listening to, something that has been meaningful uh, to you uh, recently in terms of, of what you're encountering out there. There's a whole lot of material. There's a whole lot of, uh, of great stuff. But help us kind of weed through, if you will, or even just sort through um, some things that could help us grow in our own faith and uh, in our own faith sharing and uh, and we're calling it what I found. What I found. Well, that's a that's an interesting question, especially again as as we said we're we're taping this uh, right after the uh, the election in the United States, and um, I think what I've found recently is um, the real need, uh, and and this is in the context that we're in now again post post-election context in the United States, because uh, that's that's where I live. Um, and so that's what's been swirling around my life. Um, but what I have uh, what I have found is um, that there is a real need for Christians uh, for the the church with a jo- with a capital C, not you know, not a small C, but the all Christians um, to really begin, um, being as deliberate as we can to provide an alternative um, a vision for our culture uh, rather than being an echo of our culture. And I think that's just a really crucial thing to think about right now. How is it that we are, in, in the way we're living our lives, um, how is it that we are providing an alternative to our culture rather than being an echo of our culture? And I haven't, um, I haven't gotten the the answer completely mapped out, but the thing that I'm thinking about now more than I ever have before is the is the need um, to emphasize mm-hmm. confession rather than blame, because uh, right now, in, in at least again in, in in the United States culture, uh, it's a culture of blame and a culture of of uh, it's not my fault; it's an, anyone and everyone else's fault. When the reality is, uh, we all bear the burden of blame to some degree or another uh, for the for the situation that is in our culture. And I, I mean that on a grand scale, but I also mean it on the small scale of our individual lives and our individual relationships. Human beings are e- really like to, to blame. <laughs> we don't like to ta- bear responsibility. But as Christians, we need to begin to model confession uh, and a willingness to ask uh, for forgiveness, not only from God but from the from others. Um, and I think that if, if we take that seriously, if that take that responsibility seriously, we will provide uh, 
a dramatic alternative to our culture rather than being an echo of it. Okay, Rob, I'm going to flip it back to you. What have you found? Well, I have a book that has been uh, one of those things that's been around a little bit, and you just finally pick it up and get to it. I have a reading stack sometimes that I've got to work through. And uh, it's from uh, our friend and colleague, Kevin Watson. And um, it's called A Blueprint for Discipleship. Now, you know, he's written the Stirk on the class meeting. He's written material on the band meeting, which is wonderful. And it has transformed so many corners of Methodism. And, uh, and I highly commend those two. Uh, at the same time, a blueprint for discipleship um, is really a straightforward thing. I like the way Kevin's very personal in it. It's uh, designed for small groups. And so if a church was going to do some of these things that we've been talking about, discipleship and in terms of evangelism, I think it's another way, of course, I think Embrace is, is right up there, tip top. But I think a blueprint for evangelism would be a way that um, a small group or even an individual uh, could really examine uh, their own lives on, on how they could do that. I agree. I agree. Blueprint for Discipleship. I haven't read it in a long time, but I did read it, and it was it is yes. an excellent book. That's yeah, a he's, great He's very approachable, and, and Kevin has such a whimsical way of teaching anyway, and that really comes through in the writing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Kim, thank you again uh, for taking the time to talk with us today on the podcast. Um, it's always a joy, and uh, we always learn so much uh, when you're here. Well, it was great being here. Really enjoyed it. We encourage you uh, to look through today's show notes for links to those things. Kim, if someone wanted to reach you and find out more about Embrace or some of these things that you've been talking about, how would they uh, best reach you? Uh, you can reach me at info at worldmethodist.org. Um, that's probably the most uh, straightforward way to get in touch with me. And if you want to look for me, you can uh, reach me at podcast at worldmethodist.org. Also, in today's show notes, you'll find the social media connections for World Methodist Evangelism. If you want to reach me on social media, you can find me at Dr. Rob Haynes. That's D-R-R-O-B-H-A-Y-N-E-S across Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all the others. Our thanks again to Christchurch Global for sponsoring this episode. I'm Rob Haynes for Kim Reisman, and you've been listening to WME's Real Faith, Real World Podcast. Mm-hmm.